what I think you can do is and should do and and must do really is to go from what is to what could be if we want to think about what science is going to mean for our future and what it could mean for our individual experiences and uh and then knowing what could be can inform your choices of what should be Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and I'm speaking with Frank Wilczek, Nobel Laureate in Physics in 2004 and Templeton Prize winner recently in 2022, and an old friend of Closer to Truth. Frank, <laughs> it's great to see you again. Congratulations on the Templeton Prize. Well, it's great to see you also, and thank you. Yeah, I'm very pleased and happy. Let's start <laughs> with, with a discussion of the Templeton Prize. Uh, how were you informed? Were you surprised? I was surprised because it's uh, it's a prize that is very diverse. In um, so I, you know, I thought of it as a logical possibility, but I certainly wasn't anticipating it. Well, first I got a an email, I believe, asking if I would take a call from Heather Templeton Dill. I looked up Heather Templeton Dill, and, and uh, I wasn't sure that that would mean that I was getting the prize. It might have been she was asking for me to serve on some committee, or gosh knows what. But 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 I thought at that point the probability went from one percent to maybe fifty percent, and and then uh, and then I uh, you know, talked with her, and and uh, yes, she she told me that I was. Uh, a candidate for the prize. It was mine if I wanted to accept it, and I didn't hesitate very long. I was very happy, very happy to accept. That's great. The, the, the Templeton Prize on the, on their website says it, it's for harnessing the power of the sciences to explore the deepest questions of the universe, and I can't think of anyone who would fit that uh, more than you. And we'll talk a lot about that. It also talks about uh, humankind's place and purpose within it in the four books that you have and the one coming up. Um, are directly on that. Although I have to ask you, purpose, that word purpose, uh, sometimes is a sensitive word in, in, uh, in science. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, and uh, I interpret it, I'm going, I'm, I'm in, I, how should I say? I like to say that uh, when, when people ask me whether God exists, I say, to me, God is a work in progress. And <laughs> And, some, and purpose has very much to do with that. I think it's possible to uh, think about what, in, in, a, in an informed way and a meaningful way and an informative way, uh, what purpose is. And this is what I'm really getting at in, in, in the book that I'm writing now, sort of been leading up to it all my life, I feel. Uh, to me, uh, famously, Hume made the distinction between is and ought, mm. and that you could never get from statements about is to statements about ought. So, kind of, that's called Hume's gu guillotine. <laughs> that <laughs> chops the connection between science and purpose, I guess, pretty pretty distinctly. And I think, as a matter of logic, uh, it's hard not to agree with that. You can't. You cannot, by logical deduction deduce from what is what ought to be. Uh, but what I think you can do is, and should do, and, and must do really, is to go from what is to what could be. If we want to think about what science is going to mean for our future and what it could mean for our individual experiences, and uh, and then knowing what could be can inform your choices of what should be. So I think in that indirect way, you can get from is to not a command, not a choice, a, a definite choice of what ought to be or what should be, but a kind of menu of options that you can look at in an intelligent way and and see what's would possible that, and what you want to pick, <laughs> right? And, would that would that mean that should is a subset of could? 
Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I, well, uh, I like what uh, what Feynman said was is poetic and very much connected to this. He said that in 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 science we have to use tremendous imagination, but it's imagination in a straitjacket. <laughs> and, and I think thinking about what should be without considering what could be is. Uh, even dangerous, but certainly not as fruitful as thinking about what could be and and uh, understanding what the real options are. So, so maybe could and should are like Venn diagrams that partially overlap. And so what you're saying is you the, the part of should that doesn't overlap could, we, we, we eliminate. <laughs> it's less interesting. Or it's, it's, yeah, well, I guess it can be interesting to talk about worlds with rainbows and unicorns and uh, things like this but uh but if you're thinking about futures and about a tangible physical reality and including our shared reality uh the could the 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 things that both that could be are have a special uh, a special status and 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 to me uh, in thinking about what should be, focusing on those is especially useful. Right. Great. So as the Templeton Prize explores the deepest questions of science, that leads us, of course, to your physics. And what I want to do is really understand the the chronology and development of, of your, your thinking uh, in this area. And uh, let's start with... Uh, Obviously, your Nobel Prize dealing with the strong force that uh, holds atomic nuclei together, quantum chromodynamics, asymptotic freedom. Can't wait to hear the story. In our present understanding, which is very rich and detailed and successful in many, many ways, uh, there are four distinct forces of nature. There's gravity and electromagnetism, which are the classic forces that uh, have been studied now for centuries. Uh, and, but then there are two other forces that the physicists found had to be introduced in order to understand uh, what you observe when you study subatomic physics, and especially nuclear physics. Uh, you find that there's a strong force which is responsible for holding nuclei together. And as we came to understand it more deeply, we understood that uh, the protons and neutrons, are, which are sort of the usual description of what nuclei are made of, uh, has to go. you have to go one level deeper and talk about quarks and gluons. And quarks and gluons make protons and neutrons, and then protons and neutrons make atomic nuclei. But in any case, there's a strong force that binds the quarks together and uh, and then the, and a residual part of that force binds the uh, nuclei together. And then there's the weak force, which is responsible for uh, uh, slow transformations that uh, uh, the other forces can't do, but as its name suggests, is weaker. So these two new forces were discovered, or the need for two new forces was discovered uh, early in the 20th century. And... Uh, a big part of 20th century physics was trying to figure out what those two forces are uh, to get a, uh, an understanding of those two forces, which is worthy to stand behind our profound understanding of gravity and of electromagnetism. And uh, the strong force was particularly difficult to, uh, to unravel uh, because, well, first of all, the it, it's in in nature it, it manifests itself only at very short distances, and because it's so strong, uh, it's it's difficult to sort of analyze one little bit at a time because it's all it's it always calls into into account a lot of effects. It's uh, so it's it's as if you were trying to understand hydrodynamics and all you had access to was. Uh, turbulent, turbulent water. Uh, it's almost literally like that, in fact. But, uh, but we managed. <laughs> we managed to uh, uh, make a key discovery which, which broke that problem open, 
which was that if you study the strong force at very high energies or at very short distances, uh, it gets weak. And so if you can isolate the physical processes, isolate within the physical processes that you see, the effects that are character characteristic of very high energies or very short distances, then the strong force becomes simple. And uh, we were able to figure out a candidate theory based that would explain these, uh, these simplicities and the fact that the force got weak at short distances. That's called asymptotic freedom, uh, which is easy to verbalize and but most forces don't act that way. <laughs> most forces get stronger at short distances. And in fact, it was very difficult to find any theory that had that property and was consistent with relativity and quantum mechanics. So any quantum field theory in which the force had that character. Uh, when we studied the problem, we found basically that there was only one theory that had the property. And so we were able to say that that theory has to be the theory of the strong force in nature. So that was like a, a highly leveraged kind of a gift from God to see that this, this clue led you to crack the whole problem open, but, but it did. And, uh, you know, it's, that theory has gone from triumph to triumph and people have gotten better and better at calculating more and more things. Uh, with the help of super supercomputers, they can even calculate the turbulent part when it's the, the force is no longer so weak, and and yeah, and and so that's it's it's had all kinds of consequences within physics, uh, notably, for instance, and very much leading into my subsequent work, it made it possible to think intelligently about the very early universe, because at, in the very early universe. It, it threatened to get out of control and opaque because you had this very strong force, which uh, uh, became very, very powerful. And the, the, the protons and neutrons became all close together. It was one giant nucleus and you didn't understand the nuclear force. So what the heck are you going to do about this? But, but with uh, asymptotic freedom, with, the, with this realization that the force actually becomes weaker at short distances and high energy suddenly the early universe was the easiest thing to understand and that that opened because up if, it, if it were acting if it were acting normally the everything would just clump together in one gigantic black hole uh, and you black could, hole and, or yeah first of all first an atomic a giant atomic nucleus sort of like a giant neutron star yeah. And then ultimately into a, presumably into some kind of black hole, but and nothing, uh, and nothing thereafter would have happened without us. But, but in freedom. any case, what whatever happened, we wouldn't be able to figure it out. <laughs> without, <laughs> right. Yes. Right. All right, let, let, let's let, let's go on. So uh, you've been working on uh, axions for uh, a long time, um, and I just just want to get quickly a sense of what was the initial driving force behind that. And then, then it became a potential candidate for dark matter. I think those are two separate kinds of things, right? Those are two developments, right? But, uh, but it's the same theory, and, and, and so that the cosmology was kind of an unanticipated consequence of theoretical ideas developed for another purpose. Which, you know, when you get out more than you put in, you begin yeah, to believe in it. <laughs> you yeah. begin to believe. Uh, any case, the initial problem was came out of our triumph in understanding the strong and weak forces and getting beautiful, uh, powerful theories of those things, which were increasingly experimentally verified, beginning in the mid seventies and going going from triumph to triumph. Uh, so we had a theory that contained a pretty good account of all the known forces of nature. Uh, and we, be, you know, we think of this as close to the the last word. You know, this is God speaking. This is how the world is made, and and so we should hold it to high standards, high aesthetic standards of logical coherence and 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 symmetry. And and if you judge what we got by those standards, as opposed to just success, <laughs> uh, there were some annoying 
features, annoying aesthetic flaws, uh, one of which is the following that turned out, it sounds almost esoteric, but turned out to be the key to under, to uh, a new chapter, well, which may include understanding what the dark matter is, but in any case has certainly been a, a fruitful source of papers in theoretical physics. The uh, So the laws of physics, beginning from when they were first formulated with any precision with Isaac Newton, uh, have had a very peculiar property, the base, the fundamental laws have had a very peculiar property that is not manifested in everyday life. That is that if you run the fundamental laws backwards in time, they look the same. <laughs> so if you took a picture of uh, events at an atomic level or going to the other extreme, if you take a picture of planets revolving around the sun, according to Newton's laws, and uh, uh, made a mistake and uh, took put in the film backwards, so it ran backwards in time, it would still look like it's obeying the laws of physics. And that's really an unusual property. And it continued to be true as physics took in more and more uh, phenomena and expanded its reach into electromagnetism and added quantum mechanics and got a, a more sophisticated theory of gravity with general relativity and uh, and the quantum theory came in and you had quantum electrodynamics and and even in our theories of the strong and weak forces they still always had this uh, uh as we understood more and more they uh they had this property but then in 1964 an experiment by uh, Val Fitch, Jim Cronin, and collaborators at Brookhaven National Laboratory uh, studying in detail the decay properties of K mesons, so highly unstable particles that you only produce at accelerators, found that the laws governing K meson decays did not obey this, uh, this reversibility in re with respect to time. There were very small violations of that principle, which made it even stranger. When it, when it, when it was exact, you could think that, well, that's rock bottom. That's a very nice qualitative rule that, that maybe that's what nature wants to do. And, you know, who are we to say that that's, you know, that, that's, that's not okay. But, but when it's almost, but not quite, that's really irritating. That's an aesthetic flaw that we really wanted to understand. And uh, as our theories uh, matured in the early 1970s, our theories of all these forces, it was possible to begin to understand this feature this time, so-called time reversal symmetry of the laws based on it being kind of an almost accidental consequence of more fundamental principles. So if you imposed on the fundamental laws, uh, the principles of relative, that, that we, we, they need to be consistent with relativity, they need to be consistent with quantum mechanics, and they need to be consistent with the guiding principle of the, of the standard model, of our model of all the forces, which is called local gauge symmetry, so high amounts of symmetry in the equations, then almost as an accidental consequence, uh, you get strong constraints on the possible interactions, and those constraints basically narrow down the possibility for time reversal violation to exactly what Cronin and Fitch saw. And that, that theoretical understanding led to predictions of uh, about the decay properties of heavier quarks and more detailed predictions. And many, many experiments now have verified that understanding. But there's, a, but there's one annoying but to this beautiful story, which is that uh, the constraints actually allow another interaction so the, there is another possible source of time reversal symmetry violation that does not occur in nature, or at least it's very, very small. So that was the aesthetic flaw that 
we wanted to fix. And it turns out that there's a very, very nice way to fix it, uh, sort of sketched by uh, uh, two physicists named Roberto Peche and Helen Quinn, and then called the Peche-Quinn mechanism, that extends the laws of physics to include a, a new sector, a new, it, it does, it's not a very big sector, but it's very special and has a high amounts of symmetry. So it's a worthy addition to our beautiful laws of physics. And uh, uh, Steve Weinberg and I pointed out that as a consequence of this extension of the laws, there would be a new kind of particle that we, he, he wanted to call it the Higlet originally, but I was calling it the axion. We were working on this independently uh, and learned through intermediaries that we were basically doing similar work. And uh, so we, we consulted and decided to uh, synchronize our uh, uh, submissions and so forth and, 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 and have a common name and agree on, to a name. So uh, he very graciously and wisely uh, deferred to Axion from Higlet. <laughs> and so, so Axions were born. And at first, uh, the theory was uh, implemented by just saying that the fields involved should be in their lowest energy state at present, because physicists thinks that things settle down to their lowest energy state, uh, given a chance, and um, and uh, that and that would solve the problem. However, uh, nowadays we're not we, we 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 shouldn't take that for granted. I mean, in in retrospect, we shouldn't have taken that for granted. We really should ask what the universe wants to do, <laughs> not what not not just say that it's going to settle into the lowest energy state. And when we examined the equations more carefully, so we put the equations of axions into the equations of cosmology, the Big Bang Theory, which uh, I should say was much better established by the time. Uh, uh, it wasn't so well established when we did the original work, but it, came, it got, as a, it, shortly afterwards, it became dramatically better established. So then we... Uh, we had to uh, take that into account. And uh, what we found was that the universe almost settles into its low energy state in this theory, but the difference between the very lowest energy state and the actual state that's predicted is the dark matter. <laughs> it differs, <laughs> differs by a, a phenomenon that uh, astronomers had actually observed. They wanted something that's not quite in its lowest energy state, that has this extra stuff. And the axion theory gives a beautiful account of the dark matter. Uh, and what we'd like to do now to, to really, uh, well, check that the ideas are right and bring it bring this circle of ideas to its logical uh, climax is to observe this dark matter in other ways than just through its gravity. At present, it's only observed through gravity. And the axion theory predicts that axions have other interactions that are very, very weak. So it's consistent with the properties of dark matter that make it difficult to observe and so far uh, only observed through gravity. But they're not zero. And uh, there's been a big, big effort in recent years to design instruments that would detect axions if they are the dark matter to, to see them in other ways than, uh, than through their gravity. Let me- uh, Is there progress on that? Is yeah, there's progress? dramatic progress. Dramatic progress. I'm hoping <laughs> that we so so people have come up with designs, including uh, an effort here that I've been heavily involved in, called the Alpha Collaboration, have come up with uh, increasingly sophisticated and clever designs that exploit advances in technology, in low temperature technology, in very very sensitive electronics and low noise and things like this, and uh, and just clever electrical engineering to come up with designs that. Uh, on paper, will be sensitive enough to detect axions if they're out there. 
So in a few years, we should pretty much know one way or the other whether whether the theory uh, actually applies to our universe. Uh, and that's, that's, needless to say, very exciting. You have a standing invitation to come back at that time. <laughs> yes. That, uh, and it's been very, very much fun just to live through all these developments and, uh, you know, realize that the cosmology not only uh, supported the theory, but but led to this dramatic, uh, unexpected gift, con uh, and 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 then to think hard about designing appropriate detectors or antennas that are, could could pick up on this background of axions, and uh, and we'll see. Great. Let's uh, let's talk about two other innovative ideas that you've had and see how each one works. Uh, start with. Uh, Anion, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Anions are a kind of, a new kind of particle. I mean, there are many, many particles, but uh, they all bear a kind of family resemblance uh, to each other. They have properties like spin and mass, and uh, and that's it, really. Spin and mass are the properties of fundamental particles. Oh, and different kinds of charges, I should say. So they can have electric charge, or they can have the charges that are involved in the strong and weak interactions. But basically, that's it. They have mass, spin, and charge. Uh, anions are qualitatively different. Uh, they have a kind of memory as well. Uh, so what does it mean for a particle to have memory? Well. Particles should be described by wave functions, and when you have anions and, and move them around, their wave functions depend on how they've been moving around in the past in a very structured way. So they, it deserves to be called a kind of memory. And in fact, there are ideas that are being heavily pursued these days of exploiting anions to do information processing, and be, so to build quantum computers, to to be specific. Uh, so they, they could have significant advantages for that. In any case, these are emergent proper particles. They are not particles that exist in free space. Uh, they are things that emerge within certain materials in certain states of matter. Uh, and the materials actually have to be two-dimensional. And uh, this was a theoretical possibility that uh, was pointed out uh, originally by two Norwegian physicists, Lainus and Mirheim, but I think it's fair to say that I made them physically plausible by showing how they could uh, be realized using the kinds of things we actually have in matter, and, and then pointing to a very specific state of matter where you could be quite specific that, that you would have anions. And so that was a firm prediction and people could go out and uh, test this kind of matter and see if in fact the emergent particles within that matter. So the concentrations of energy that were uh, stable and could, could be moved around, that's what you call a particle, an emergent particle in, inside these kinds of states of matter, whether they had the predicted properties. And I thought at the time, which I think the original prediction was 1982, or maybe it was 1984, that, that kind of time anyway. I thought that it would be tested and successfully <laughs> within a few months. This, unlike axions, this is, this is a deductive theory. This is not uh, inspired guesswork. It's not, uh, it's not proposing new laws of nature, so to speak, but it's using the laws of nature we have in order to predict qualitatively new proper potentials of matter. Uh, but, uh, and many people tried to observe this behavior, but for, I thought it would, would not be difficult because, you know, we're not talking about building an accelerator. These are very much tabletop experiments, but uh, quantum systems are very delicate and, uh, and the materials have to be very pure. You have to have them in large magnetic fields. Anyway, there are a variety of just really uh, very da uh, humdrum obstacles to actually testing these ideas. And it was only uh, about two years ago now 
that really definitive tests were done. And of course, it works. <laughs> and that was, that was quite wonderful to see. Beautiful experiments. I mean, uh, and uh, the, uh, and that I think the technology that, that people developed in order to track this down, uh, now, now that you know how to do it, you know what the secret sauce is and how the materials have to be prepared, I think progress should be quite rapid. And then the other thing that's happened is, I mean, there have been thousands, thousands of papers on this subject or theoretical papers. The, the other big thing that's happened is that uh, people have realized that you could also uh, engineer anions. You could sort of, you know, make artificial anions uh, and not just rely on exotic states of matter and use them as elements of quantum computing. So that that's a big effort that uh, uh, as has is beginning to pay off also, right? Part of the reason you're talking about it is that the uh, quantum number is fractional and therefore you could have yes. particles can wind together and therefore create the stability in some sense? That's, that's, that's how the anions, that's how, that was how the original concept arose, is that in some states of matter, uh, we realized in the, in the, in the early 80s that... Uh, what we were taught in in quantum mechanics classes is not quite right. <laughs> that that uh, that the electron, for instance, is the quantum of electric charge, and you can't ever find anything with a smaller charge. It turns out that in in certain states of matter, and I'll I'll tell you the name just uh, in in the so-called fractional quantum Hall effect, which is a whole bunch of states of matter that are uh, closely related conceptually, although but physically distinct, uh, electrons actually decay into smaller particles that have a fraction of the electron charge, and also in some sense a fraction of some of their other properties. And when you have these fractions of electrons, they have the uh, the feature that when you have an electron that goes around another electron, the wave function gets a minus sign. But when a fraction of an electron goes around a fraction of electrons, a lot of a lot of strange things can happen. <laughs> and that that what that's what's opened up this whole field of anions, realizing that and uh, and finding that many states of two-dimensional matter support those kinds of emergent particles. And then, and then also that you can engineer them, and then they might be useful. And particularly, you said in quantum computers, where the um, the the need to isolate the qubits is the most yes. critical question. So that's you right. So this way of storing quantum information turns out to be uh, more robust, more safe against many kinds of disturbance, noise, than than other. Uh, other possible routes to doing useful quantum information processing. So it, it's more difficult to get off the ground, but, and I think we're getting it off the ground. And once, once you get it off the ground, it, it's, it's, it's more robust. It's more likely, I think, to, to lead to long-term success. Let's go on to uh, time crystals, uh, which as I try to understand, it repeats in top in in things in time as opposed to space or something that may sound very exotic or it may may sound very familiar i mean that's that's what clocks do right <laughs> but the thing about time crystals is that in a way they're they're uh objects that want to be clocks so you don't have to you don't have to mechanically uh tune them to be clocks. They want to be clocks. So they automatically, of, of their own volition, so to speak, uh, organize themselves into things that have uh, structure in time. And, uh, so that, and we've understood that that is a, uh, at first we thought of it as a theoretical possibility, and now there are compelling actual experimental realizations of that. So 
So, so things that want to be clocks could be very good clocks. I guess that's that's the, that's the hope for the using these things. But in any case, they're very interesting theoretically because they they give us a whole new class of states of matter to play with. And I think you've said it; uh, they could be used to improve atomic clocks, which are, are incredibly well. Atomic accurate. clocks are very very good, and and the technology has been. Uh, uh, honed over over decades and by now is extraordinarily good however it's there's room for improvement because the really good atomic clocks are you know not not wristwatches they're they're things that fill laboratories are big heavy are big and heavy and uh and kind of uh unwieldy so so for instance the clocks that run gps have to go up on satellites and uh and it's expensive because they're big, bulky things. And and if you could have uh, simpler clocks that were were robust, even if they weren't quite as exact, in uh, you know exact uh, precise, they could be very useful. And so so there's there's room for improvement in some directions, and there's even room for and and reason to improve uh, in pure accuracy. So and uh, I think employing the ideas that go into time crystals that have been emerging from their study uh, could very well uh, give new ways of either synchronizing a bunch of atomic clocks to be more accurate than any individual atomic clock or making new time new kinds of clocks that uh, uh, well it'll be a long time probably before they can compete with atomic clocks in terms of pure accuracy but might might compete in terms of uh, uh, portability and ease of use and 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 cost. Yeah, I think accuracy now is like one second for the entire history of the universe. Uh, Thirteen point right. eight billion. So that, that sounds pretty accurate. And you might ask, why do you want to get more accurate than that? But the point is that in many applications of clocks, including GPS, for instance, uh, you want to use timing to measure space, spatial distances very accurately. And the reason you can do that is that you can chain, if you can you use the speed of light, which is a universal constant, allows you to chain, to uh, interpret time delays as distances. But the point is the time delays that correspond to reasonable distances can be very, very small. And so if you want to get accurate measurements of the distances, you have to be me- able to measure uh, time, times very, very, very accurately. So, so e- even accuracies would sound ridiculous. Why would you want to measure, uh, have clocks that are accurate to more than one second in the lifetime of the universe? But actually, there are very good reasons that you would want that. <laughs> that <laughs> what surprised me about time crystals is, is the possibility that you talked about molecular motors that could be found in living systems that might have some characteristics they, of, of yes, time crystals. Yes, that's right. By, by a kind of looser definition of time crystals, uh, mo- uh, molecular motions, molecular motors that are driven by thermal fluctuations could could develop a systematic motion and uh, that was that uh, uh, of course would would on large time scales be repetitive and uh, and that would be a kind of time crystal too uh, I think at present that's kind of a theoretical dream but I don't think I don't think it's out of reach and that's one of the things we're trying to uh nail down right now i'm going to ask you a crazy question frank because i know you're you have uh, incredibly uh, diverse uh, uh activities going on uh, I, i'm just going to get give your 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 titles uh you're the herman fishback professor of physics at mit which of course has been your main main uh, home for for decades you're the founding director and chief scientist at the wilcheck quantum center at shanghai jiao tong university Distinguished Professor at Arizona State and Professor of Physics, where you now are at uh, Stockholm University. So, as you look at the array of all the things you're doing, how, roughly order of magnitude, how do you allocate your time among the the different? I don't really care about the ge- the different geography, but the, but the different technologies or the different theoretical categories. 
well, my life is full. <laughs> and that, that, let me say that first. There's there's a rhythm to uh, to research, in my experience. Sometimes uh, one idea is flourishing and moving fast. Uh, other times, another idea is moving fast. Sometimes nothing is moving very fast, and uh, so I, I I'm uh, always uh, sort of scanning. You know, it's like it's like a computer that scans all the different applications and sees where there's activity, uh, and 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 focuses in on that one. Uh, and one thing I've learned to do in recent years is, uh, uh, well, get help. <laughs> I've been very fortunate in, in at all of my institutions, really, to find uh, collaborators that are very, very able. And uh, I can participate, you know, by uh, giving, by, by making some seed ideas and then helping, helping nourish them. But uh, I get a lot of help in doing that. And, and that's what makes it possible. So, but what are some, so take the theoretical categories you're working on and just give me rough order of magnitude right now. It may change tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> What your current focus is? Well, one of the, one major focus is certainly this uh, axion uh, detection possibility. Building building a detector based on the principle of that we discovered of uh, pl so called plasma haloscopes. Uh, so that I've I've this is the first time I've really been involved at this level in a an experimental effort from the beginning and it's been a fascinating thing to participate in and and it really is like a startup <laughs> where you bring in people with different expertise and and you have to manage different timelines and so on. it's uh and it's, where, where, it's are it? where are you doing it where are, oh where well, are you? <laughs> it's everywhere. Uh, seems everywhere. everywhere. Uh, the uh, probably the main experiment will be done at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, where uh, there's a big magnet that that's suitable. So the the most sort of expensive piece of hardware part of this experiment is just a very very large powerful magnet that uh, and and so those 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 are are hard to construct, hard to maintain and expensive. And fortunately we've kind of fallen into one at uh, Oak Ridge, that's available at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, we may also have a, another magnet at Uppsala, uh, but prototyping has gone on here at Stockholm, uh, at Berkeley where uh, Carvin and Bibber and his group have been doing axion experiments with that bring in a lot of the same expertise, but are different in detail but they've they've jumped in with both feet to this and have built been building prototypes some prototypes have been built here at uh, stockholm and there's also we also have collaborators at uh, st petersburg who have been specializing it turns out for completely different reasons in the kind of so-called metamaterials the kind of arrays of antenna like arrays if you like that we want to use for axion detection. They've, they've built similar things for other purposes. So they've been also been able to help us with prototype and, and uh, simulation and, you know. So we have uh, Berkeley, uh, Stockholm, St. Petersburg, Oak Ridge. And we also have individuals from other places in the world. But those that's, that's terrific. Well, you have a standing invitation Whenever there's whenever there's results, come on back and, and, and tell us. <laughs> yeah, right. Frank this has been absolutely delightful. We'll talk again and uh, and and yeah. and follow the trail. All right. Bye for now. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing.